Uh, well, thank you, uh, Roger, and, and, and thank you for, uh, uh, and, and to the National History Center for setting up this, uh, this panel uh, at AHA. Um, I wear both hats, uh, journalist and uh, historian. I worked for a newspaper in my 20s in Beirut and um, know about having to write quickly and then let it go which is the opposite of what historians do. Right? To keep things for a long time and write and rewrite them and not let them go. I had a, a, a historian friend who was on an email list with me and uh, he, he, his, his book was, I think, somewhat unfairly attacked on the email list. And he wrote to me and he said, I think I should reply because you know you don't always know whether you should reply to a negative review and often it's not a good idea. But I thought, in this case, he should. So I, I encouraged him. He wrote me back. He said, well, it would just take me two weeks to get my materials together. <laughs> I said, no, no, don't do that. You'd just be reminding them that at some point in the ancient past, you were attacked. Uh, well, I have made an argument recently in the journal Contemporary History uh, that, uh, uh, that there should be such a thing as current affairs history. And uh, I, I looked into the history of the journal, Contemporary History, and it, it was a reaction against the tendency, in, in, especially in, in Europe, not to write history uh, of anything uh, that anyone could, who was living could remember. It was felt that it was still too hot. Uh, and they rebelled. The young historians of the 60s in, in Britain rebelled against the stricture and said, well, you know, we can't, we can't not write about World War I and World War II and, and so forth. But even they didn't imagine that they would actually write the history of the 60s in the 60s. They, they were still, they think we should bring up the, the, the limit to 20 years, you know, 30 years, uh, instead of having it be 70 or 80. Uh, well, I'm arguing that the limit is yesterday. And um, uh, the, the Arab Spring uh, is, is, a, is a wonderful uh, arena for considering how to write contemporary history. Um, and I would argue that for the Middle East today, uh, there are many advantages to writing contemporary history, maybe over uh, advantages that don't exist for earlier periods. You just think about it. If I wanted to write a history of the 1970s in Egypt, well, the Egyptian archives are not open for the 1970s, so I would have access to no Egyptian archival information. And uh, I don't know if there's anybody here from the State Department or the people that declassify our own records, but we're supposed to have a 30-year rule. I think they're behind. So it's entirely possible that I wouldn't have any American records for this period I wanted to write about in Egypt in the 1970s. So what would I have? I would have, you know, the New York Times and the, the Al Ahram. I would have journalism, and I would have to go back and depend on what the journalists thought at that time. I wouldn't be able to get what, you know, what professional historians do is, is try to get the original documentary information from the principals. Well, for the for the zeros, um, we should have a moment of silence for Bradley Manning. But we have the State Department records for their interactions with the Mubarak regime uh, because of, of WikiLeaks. Uh, and then the Arabic internet uh, has developed to the point where there are many archival type documents in Arabic on the web uh, and, and there's been whistleblowers and uh, their speeches and I would argue that I could write the history of the last 10 years of Egypt as a professional historian from a firmer documentary base than I could write the history of the 1970s in Egypt. So contemporary history shouldn't be set aside as, as somehow uh, facile or superficial. Uh, uh, and and because, of, uh, because of the internet, because of uh, mounds of new kinds of docu documentary evidence that we have access to, things can change. Now with regard to the Arab Spring and how to interpret it and the controversies over interpreting it, Let's just recall briefly uh, what has happened. Um, the, the myth, the story, the, the meaningful story, not in the sense it's not true, although it's probably not, but the, 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 the myth uh, is that a, a vegetable seller who was, had an education, 
probably high school rather than college. Uh, you know, in, in French-speaking Arabic countries, they call the high school degree a baccalaureat. And I think that confused the American journalists, and they thought he had a, big, a bachelor's degree. Uh, but he couldn't get a proper job and was living in this podunk town southwest uh, Tunisia and reduced to peddling vegetables or some say fruit and was mistreated by the local police, which is very believable. I was in, remember Leila, we were both in Tunisia in the, in the 90s on the Social Science Research Council. The police in Tunisia were mean. They would just like harass people for no reason. They had an ethos of it. Uh, it it's about hierarchy and dominance and so forth. But, so they harassed the, the, the peddler and said, well, where's your permit? So he shows them his permit. They don't like his attitude, so they tear it up. So it seems like you don't have a permit. So then he has to spend the whole next day in the bureaucracy getting another permit, and the lady there doesn't like his attitude, and she slaps him and sends him home humiliated. So he's at the end of his rope, and he, he, he douses himself with, with gasoline, sets himself on fire. And he goes to hospital. He survives for a little bit. And this story, however, touches everybody's heartstrings, because a very large number of young people in Tunisia, and older people too, felt blocked by the economic situation, by the regime, uh, by what they'd lived through uh, in the past 30 or 40 years. And uh, so uh, there's just this emotional outpouring for this young man who, 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 who committed this act of desperation. And it gets to the president's ears, and uh, Zainuddin bin Ali, uh, known to his critics as Zaba, uh, goes to visit to the young man in the hospital. It, it, and it's a photo op. It was really quite unwise. Because it, it, the whole thing was an act of, of hypocrisy and bad faith. And actually, you know, the poor young man is there and the bed has been burned over his body. And, and Ben Ali has this sickly looking expression on his face in the photo which makes it very clear that he's, he, he finds it difficult to s sympathize with this young man as he was trying to impress people that he was. And uh, the public reaction to this was, was just devastating. Now, Tunisia was a little police state, and people were under surveillance. And they're like, oh, really? we don't know exactly. 150,000 secret police in a, in a, in a country of, uh, of 10 and a half million that's like there were more secret police than there were factory workers. Uh, and uh, uh, so, um, uh, but, you know, they weren't as numerous or effective out in the small towns uh, of, of Tunisia. In a place like Sidi Bouzid, people could gather and demonstrate, and the secret police weren't around. So, and they started gathering and demonstrating. And then it spread from Sidi Bouzid to the next town, and the next town, and it got bigger, and it was sustained. And then it went to the capital, and people started coming down Habib Bourguiba Avenue, and you had 200,000 people in, in, in Habib Bourguiba Avenue. And, and you know, any historian will tell you that if you're a ruler and you're in the capital, the, you want to make the people in the capital happy. It's not quite so important if people in the periphery are not happy, but if People in the capital are not happy, you're in danger. Because they can move on the presidential palace, they can move on the Ministry of Interior. So this enormous crowds were gathering in Tunis, and they, uh, they, they came every day, and they got bigger and bigger. And they were of all kinds. You can see the pictures. You know, There were unveiled women. There were veiled women. There were uh, workers. There were middle class people. There were youth. Um, it was a mass movement. Uh, and ultimately, what they were doing, in my interpretation, was putting pressure on the, the Tunisian elite to get rid of Zaba, to get rid of Zainuddin Ben Ali. Uh, and they made it clear, there's going to be no normal commerce. Nobody's going to make any money. There's going to be no security, no ordinary life for the wealthy and the comfortable people of Marsa and so forth, the, 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 the Tony parts of, of Tunis, until Zainuddin Ben Ali is gone. Now, Tunisia had a small army of only 30,000 men. And uh, Zainuddin bin Ali, who had been a general, probably kept it like that because, you know, big armies are a power base, and then they become a power base for making a coup. And he had kind of made a coup against his predecessor, so he kept the army small and weak. 
But that was also a danger because the secret police, while they're very good at spying on people, weren't necessarily good at crowd control. For that, you would need the army, but you didn't have a proper army. Uh, and when you have two or 300,000 people in the streets of your capital and you only have 30,000 men under arms, it's not clear who would win that one. So um, the story, again, this is a myth. That I don't know if it's true, and I've had Tunisians deny it to me, but the, the story is that Zain Dimon Ali goes to his uh, uh, chief of staff, uh, uh, Amar Rashid, and says, General, I want you to put down these crowds. And the general looks Zain Dimon Ali in the eye and says, Mr. President, I'm not going to shoot the Tunisian people for you. Well, if you're a dictator and you're unloved and your chief of staff tells you that, you may as well start the helicopter running right there. And of course, it was all over once the military refused to intervene in that way, uh, and they got Ben Ali out of the country. Well, this little story, uh, some of which is mythical, uh, nevertheless, was a very powerful story. And uh, it was a story that unfolded before the eyes of the people of the Arab world uh, because of satellite television. Uh, Al Jazeera, Al Arabiya, um, and others uh, covered this story. Um, in its wisdom, our 24-hour cable news, I'm, I'm putting scare quotes for those of you who are listening later at the podcast, uh, news, um, didn't cover the story. Uh, you can go back to tra tra broadcast transcripts and, and look through it in, in December and January and you will barely find Tunisia mentioned in, in CNN uh, until the very end when it was clear the president was going to be overthrown. Uh, and the US government, I can't find that they said anything about it. There was no speech, there was no, there, there was no State Department directive. After it was all over, then Jeffrey Feldman and finally of Barack Obama and wished the Tunisian people well. So it, you know why? why? Why was this such a non-story in the West, but it was riveting to the Arab world? Well, uh, Tunisia is frankly not very important. Um, it's a, a small country in North Africa. It has no particular resources. Uh, and um, it had been, and still was, mainly a French sphere of influence. Uh, the, uh, the then French uh, Minister of Defense offered Ben Ali training for his police. She seemed to think that the problem in Tunisia was that the police were not well trained. Uh, uh, in, in She's not there anymore. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, um, that was, it was a French affair uh, from, a, from a geopolitical point of view. But in the Arab world, it was existential. And it raised all kinds of questions about the youth being blocked, uh, from, uh, you know, there was very, the, the educated youth in particular in the Arab world often have much higher unemployment than the uneducated youth. So you can get a, a menial job, but you, if you've got a, a BA, you can't necessarily find employment. And um, again, as a historian, if you go back and look at the late 19th century at European nationalist movements and so forth, uh, Miroslav Roch and others have argued that you never ever want to have large numbers of unemployed educated people in your country if you're a ruler. But the Arab world was full of that kind of phenomenon. Um, and what Tunisia represented for people, I think, was, uh, was hope. Uh, that I, I've been told by Saladin Ibrahim, uh, one of, a major human rights activist in Egypt and, and uh, my former professor, that nobody thought that you could get rid of Mubarak in Egypt, Hosni Mubarak, the longtime dictator there, until Zainuddin bin Ali was expelled by the Tunisians, and then people thought, well, gee, you know, maybe you could do this. Um, the press accounts mostly focus in on, um, uh, on the internet uh, as the tool by which this was done, because you know there were Facebook pages and there Twitter and so forth. I don't deny that those things were important. Uh, I think they were a small part of the picture. Uh, I think we as historians you know, remember that there was that spot of trouble in France in 1789 when there was no Twitter, 